Good evening. In the name of the Father, <clears throat> Yah, and His Son, Messiah, Yahweh Shai, we come to you on this Wednesday evening, continuing our Wednesday evening series since the COVID-19 virus came among us, and speaking on current events and things pertaining to the times in which we live, um, which we believe to be the last years of the history of the evil empire of Babylon, the last years of the history of this world system as we know. For the Bible does show us very plainly, Messiah will return to destroy this entire world system. And only that which is in Messiah, which also is in the Father by Messiah, will stand. This morning, Sometimes what I do, well, a lot of times what I do, I have a couple, a couple of ways of studying my Bible. And I, I'm sure that there's a lot of you that can, when I explain this, there's a lot of you that will understand. There's the, there's the way I'm studying, which I systematically go through the Word from cover to cover. And I seek to do it on an annual basis. Now, this past year, I didn't do it. I'm kind of in my second year of, of, of one reading of it because I was reading other things like the Apocrypha, trying to get... Uh, some sense of whether that was legit or not, but that's a different story. But I was Shabbat Shalom, blessings. Um, but uh, I have a systematic reading of the scriptures where I go from Genesis through to Revelation and I'll probably be finished one, one time this year at the end of the year in the fall, usually I, I complete it. And so it'll probably be my 16th or 17th, I, I lost count, 16 or 17 times that I've read through the scriptures from cover to cover. And I admonish all people to do this, particularly those that feel they have been called to teach the word. If you feel like the Most High has inspired you to teach his word, you must read through the Bible from cover to cover several times over several years. You must do that because if you're going to be a teacher of the word, you must be first partaker of the fruits of the word. You must first be given an understanding by the Father's Spirit of the Word. And so you cannot do that by cherry-picking here and there verses and hoping that you get the whole Word. That's that's what the Gentiles do, and, and that's how, how they mishandle Yah's Word, and that teaches of Yah in these last days of the, of the scattered nation of Israel. We want to be more thorough and acquainted with the Word of our Father. Also, what I do, aside from that systematic, what I often do is I'll just pray and I'll put my finger somewhere and I'll open up the scripture and wherever my eyes fall, I begin to read. Okay. And so, uh, I, so I did that uh, this morning and I came to Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and it was, and it's always, every time I do it, I find something new and I find something powerful and I find something that the most high has given me to cause me to grow in his spirit and also as a teacher of his word. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12, a very well-known passage of scripture. I'm going to read it as it says in, in the King James Bible, Ecclesiastes chapter 12, and I'm going to start at verse 12. And further by these, my son, be admonished, of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear Yah and keep his command, for this is the whole duty of man. For Yah shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. Now, one thing I've mentioned in the past, and I'm going to mention it here, is that the translators of the Bible, the translators of the Bible uh, were Englishmen, of the King James Bible, were English. I mean, you had German translations from Luther, but those have been, even among Christians, known to be not the best translations um, because he did not use the most clear, uh, pure manuscripts. But Tyndale, who was one of the English translators, in fact, the most important English translator because the King James Bible is, is, is very much based off the Tyndale translation of the Bible. And what he did and what the translators did in the 1611 King James is they added words to the Bible in places that they thought would make it clearer for the English to understand. 
Okay, they did that, and and they did it. They didn't do it. I, I don't believe, as I've studied the Bible, like I said multiple times from cover to cover, I don't think they did it in a malicious manner. Obviously, when you study the the prophecies, you will understand that that's not the case. But it's not always the correct way. And what do I mean by that? How do we know that? Well, what I do often is when I see an italicized word, I take the word out. And I look at how the scripture reads without the italicized word. And then if it comes clearer to me, if, it, if the meaning becomes deeper, then I know we don't need the italicized word. Oftentimes, or not oftentimes, sometimes, when you remove the italicized word, it opens up a meaning that is deep and it goes with the rest of the Bible. I find that to be true in a few places. Here in Ecclesiastes, I find that to be true. And what I did in chapter thir uh, 12, verse 13, the word duty, the whole duty of man is italicized. The word duty is italicized, which means when you see an italicized word, it wasn't in the original Hebrew manuscript. It wasn't there. The, the English translators thought maybe it would help the scripture become clearer by adding this word. Okay. In this case, if you remove the word duty, let's read the verse again without the italicized word do. Okay, let's read it again, watch. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear Yah and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Now I looked up the word whole, okay? It comes from a root word, it, it comes from a root word in the Hebrew in the concordance, I think it was 3463 is the root word, kala, which means perfect complete. And that gave me a deeper understanding and appreciation of this scripture. Because when you understand, it says, fear Yah and keep his commandments. For this is the completion, the whole, the perfection of man. Doesn't that make sense? Doesn't that, doesn't that go deeper than just acting like, I mean, I'm not saying, saying it's a duty, it's not a bad thing. But when you understand that Honor and respect. When it says fear, we're talking about an honor and a respect and a reverence for the creator. And of course, keeping the commandments is obedience to his covenant. So when you have an obedience to his covenant and you have a deep honor and reverence and respect for your creator, it causes you to reach the highest levels that he created you to reach. Okay? And I think of Adam, I, when I first saw this this morning and I prayed over it, I thought of Adam. And Adam was made, as we know, in the image of Yah. He was made whole. He was made perfect. And as he continued in his obedience to Yah over the time, he was going to grow in that perfection and wholeness. He was going to grow even more. How do I know that? How do we know that from the word? Well, the Bible tells us that man was made a little lower than the angel. It tells us that. So Adam was created a little lower form than the angels. Yet Messiah did say that in the kingdom, we would be what? As the angels. So therefore, it was designed that Adam should start off a little lower than the angels and eventually become what? As the angel. And he would do that through his fear of Yah and his obedience to his commandments. Okay, now how does that, what does that have to do with you and me? Well, brothers and sisters, in the earth in which we live, there are many philosophies in which people are, people are, are striving for different things, different things um, for their own growth. There are many books on personal growth and development, and there are a multitude of books, as this thing says here, as the scripture says, the, the making of many books is no end, right? There are books on personal growth and development and how to get rich, right? How to accomplish goals. All of these, they quote, they usually you'll find them in the area of self-help, right? Self-help books to help people develop in these areas. But as followers of the ultimate source of wisdom, the Most High Yah, as followers of the ultimate source of wisdom, he is telling us that as we give him the honor and glory and respect as the creator and, and seek through his spirit to be obedient to his covenant, 
There's no self-help book. There's no book man can create to bring us to a higher level. Okay? Now, a few weeks ago, I made an announcement um, on this, on the Wednesday night it was. And the announcement I made was that we are now in the, the message of the first angel of Revelation chapter 14. We are now we have now entered into the time of the message of the first angel. Now, in Revelation 14, there are three angels. As a matter of fact, the SDA church basically built their denomination on what they call the three angels' messages. That's what they, they built their whole denomination on that and on their understanding of the sanctuary message. Um, they will tell you that these messages of these angels came sometime in the 1800s. This is incorrect. And the reason is incorrect because of what the message actually says and because of what it's intended to do. And I'm using the SDA church because they're the only church that actually talked about this message. I'm looking for something. Wipe my face. Because I'm sweating it. Excuse me. It's 90 something degrees where I'm at right now. I'm not complaining. <laughs> I'd rather this thing cold. But anyway, so. The, the Adventist church's message of the three angels is designed to get individuals that believe their message of the, of the, of the three angels to join their church. That's really what the end result is. When they go to preach what they call the three angels message, they're calling people to join their church. That's really, if you want to be honest, that's what they do. Okay. That's problem number one. Problem number two is this message has to be given from the 144,000. Okay, it cannot be given by Gentiles. It has to be given from the 144,000. As you read Revelation 14, you'll see that. It has to be initiated by them. All right? Okay, and again, let's talk about the 144,000 for a second. But before I get there, let me just show you. The first angel's message, we talked about it. Um, in Revelation chapter 14, let's read the first angel's message. Revelation chapter 14. I'm going to read Revelation 14, verse 6 and 7. Revelation chapter 14, verse 6 and 7. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear ye, and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth and the sea and the fountains of water. When you read this carefully, first of all, you understand the, the message is about an everlasting gospel. Now, I was in the Adventist church. I was a fourth generation, seventh day Adventist. Um, I have been in that church myself from ba being baptized. Uh, when I was about 21, I was in that church a good 30, 25, let's say 25 years, 20 years in that, in that vicinity. Okay. Um, okay. So I was in the church like 25 years. And again, I was fourth generation. My great grandfather was the first SDA to my, my grandmother and all her six siblings, then my mother and then, uh, and then myself. So we were like, you know, fourth generation. I never heard a clear definition or understanding of the everlasting gospel in that church. They talked about it. And, and they talked just like the Sunday churches, you know, gospel is good news. Never heard the true everlasting gospel. Okay. Now, in case you didn't hear it before from, you would hear if and I'll be amiss, remiss. Seriously. If every time I preach, you don't hear it because you got to hear it every time I preach because it's that important. Okay. It's that important. And so some of you hear it all the time, and I hope you do, because I need you to get it. Because it's life-changing when you understand it in truth. It's much higher than the Christian churches preach, much higher. And it has a lot to do with Ecclesiastes, what we talked about earlier, the whole of man. It has a lot to do with the whole of man. See, the true everlasting gospel will bring to pass the whole of man. It will heal. See, brothers and sisters, we're in a very wicked and violent world. I think everybody understands that. 
many broken homes, many hardships, many ugly things happening behind closed doors, and many people fake smiling and they're in deep pain. Many, millions. So there's a lot of healing that needs to be done. There's a lot of healing. When Messiah came the first time, when he came to the earth as a man, he spent most of his time healing people. And, and he was healing physical diseases and spiritual diseases. He was casting out devils, if you recall. He was casting out devils and people that had gone crazy. He was bringing them back into their right mind. He was doing a lot of healing. And I, I like to say, I like to say, if Messiah was on the earth today, and he walked into a hospital in the front door, went floor by floor, and healed every person on every ward, and was trying to walk out. Before he got out, they would arrest him. That's how corrupt and crooked and wicked the current system that we're in is. That's how it is. They'd rather collect billions and multi-millions and hundreds of millions of dollars for research than actually cure somebody or heal them. Okay, that, that's that's the truth about it. That's how that's how corrupt the system is that we live in. Now, the everlasting gospel um, is in many places of the scripture, but I, I gave you a big hint when I, we talked about the whole of man. Okay, but let's look at it. Romans chapter one, and we'll come right back to Revelation. Romans chapter one, verse sixteen and seventeen. Very simple, and this is the gospel. This is the everlasting. Gospel. Romans chapter 1, verses 16 and 17. Let's read. And the apostle shall all write, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Messiah, for it is the power of Yah unto salvation to everyone that believes, to the Jew first, which is the Israelite, and also to the Greek, which represents the Gentile. For therein is the righteousness of Yah revealed from faith to faith. As it is written, the just shall live by faith. There's a lot in here. In these two verses, it's a, it's a tremendous, there's a whole world in here. Let me tell you. First of all, the gospel is explained as being what? A power. It is power. Please, say that with me. It is what? It is power. This is not a philosophy. It is not a theory. See, that's the difference between this truth of the Israelite people and everybody else on the planet. We've been given power. And not talking about babbling in, in some unstrange, so-called unknown tongue. That ain't the power. This is a power to make a man whole. It's power. This is a power to change a repentant sinner and to somebody that is a representation of the Father's righteousness. That's power. Because what it says, in that power, the righteousness of Yah is revealed from faith to faith. We receive this power from the Father through repentance by faith. He pulled, what the power is called is the righteousness of of Yah. That's what it's called. It is Yah's righteousness given to us in spiritual form. Remember when Messiah was about to be baptized by the, by the Baptist and the Baptist asked him, he said, I have need to be baptized of thee and you have me baptize you? And Messiah said, suffer it to be so now for thus it becometh us to do what? To fulfill all righteousness. So the everlasting gospel is the power of the Father's Spirit coming on a repentant sinner, causing his righteousness to be revealed. And, and look, he said, the just, that word just, again, the whole ministry of the Apostle Shaul to the Gentile was teaching them justification. Justification. Because they were under the impression that they had to earn their way into salvation because that's what pagans do. Pagans seek to earn their way either today they earn their way by going to church or joining a church. Right? That's how they do it. Or if you Catholic, you say Hail Mary 
If you Muslim, you pray five times a day. And then there's some places don't you some really don't even believe in salvation. Okay, don't even believe in being being perfected. Okay, but we do, because that's how Adam we believe came into the earth, and that's how the folks the Most High through the Messiah is restoring us. So it is Father Spirit received to a repentant sinner by faith and repentance and revealing Father's righteousness through that spirit and being justified or declared innocent because of the Messiah's sacrifice for us. Being declared innocent, not because of anything we did or earned, but because of what Messiah did for us. That's where the faith comes in. If you believe in Messiah, that is the Hebrew Messiah of the tribe of Judah, of the nation of Israel, if you believe in this one, that he paid the penalty for your sin, and you will receive his father's righteousness, so that the father's spirit is revealed in you, and his righteousness is revealed, and that comes as a result of obedience. Fear Yah, and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. Okay? So this message of restoration to the lost sinner in obedience to the Father's commandments through that restoration is the first angel's message. Everlasting God. Okay? They came to preach the everlasting God. And I, and I want to tell you, very few people are teaching. Christianity is not teaching. Christianity either teaching one saved, always saved, or you saved by church membership in white Jesus. That's, that's what they really teach. And I think any Christian would be honest and say that. And what happens when you're in a Christian church, you get an initial euphoria of your experience. That's your initial euphoria. You know, they call the new believers being on fire. Then the fire goes out and you're just a church member. And any, any of you that have been in Christian churches know I'm telling the truth because I, I can't do anything else. We are living in a time in Earth's history. But we just have a few years left. And I don't have, we don't have, I don't have time and you don't have time to mess around, okay? You don't. So I'm being honest with you. If you've been in a Christian church, you know I'm telling the truth. You, you, you have an initial euphoria, an initial experience, and then it dies out, goes away, and you become a church member. And your growth in your church is based on how many people can you bring to church. And your church growth is based on how many people Come to your church. That's called church growth. In the Bible, the growth is in the growth of the spirit of the father in an individual causing the likeness of the Messiah to be replicated. That's the growth of the father. Completely different. Got nothing to do with how many people are in it. <laughs> Got nothing to do with how much money or how big your building is. Got nothing to do with that. It's got everything to do with the father's spirit of righteousness because it's got everything to do with the fear of Yah. The fear of Yah is the honor and glory and respect that's due him. We can be no more respectful, honoring, and glorying of the Father than by obedience to his covenant. Revelation chapter 14, that was verse 6. Okay? Verse 7. Saying with a loud voice, fear Yah and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment is come. And worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. What does that mean? Brothers and sisters, Messiah is not only Messiah for us. He's the high priest of the children of Israel. He's the high priest of the children of Israel. Remember, he's of the tribe of Judah. He's in the most holy place of the third heaven, interceding for the chosen. Okay? He will intercede for Gentiles, as they receive this truth from the Israelites. That's the truth. About it. How do I know that? Go to Leviticus. And I'm not going to go there now. But go to Leviticus chapter 16. Study the Day of Atonement. That, all you need is that one chapter really. And what it will show you is. The Day of Atonement was for the children of Israel. It wasn't for Gentiles. It wasn't for Egyptians. It wasn't for Babylonians. It wasn't for Greeks. It wasn't for Persians. It was for the children of Israel. Somebody might say, well, are you saying only children of Israel are going to be saved? Them and the strangers 
that dwell among them. Remember what Romans said in Romans chapter 11. You Gentiles have been grafted in when you are saved. You're When you come to the truth, you're grafted in among them, it said. Among them. Among whom? Among Israel. You're grafted in among Israel. And the true Israelites are not those Europeans that are on the land now. In the state called Israel that was created by the United Nations in 1948 by the Balfour Agreement that was signed earlier in the century. That is not the chosen people. They're not even Semitic. They're Yafetic. From Yafet, the last son of Noah. Let's take a look at that. Uh, not that exactly, but what I'm talking about here in terms of being becoming part of the nation of Israel versus a church or denomination and how Messiah came, we know he said himself, I came not but for the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Okay? Now, when you look at Ephesians, many people, and for good reasons, they look, they look at this particular verse in Ephesians. That is powerful. It's world known. Even non-Christians, people that don't know the Bible at all, like other Christians, they know this verse. Okay? In Ephesians chapter 2, the apostle is talking to the Gentiles of Ephesus. Okay? And I want you to see what he says to them. Now, we're going to read from verse 1, verse 1 down to verse 12, just to start off. See, the problem, again, with most people that read the Bible, or should I say glance at it, because you can't read it unless you read it through, but they're taking one verse and they run with it, and they don't read the context in which that verse is given. This is important, especially in the writing of the Apostle Shaul or Paul, because he, he his uh, letters are the most abused of all scriptures. The letters of the Apostle Paul are the most abused of all scripture. They really are. And so, and, it, and it's because people don't read it in this context. They don't compare it with, and oftentimes, unfortunately, the brother ties his best to quote prophets oftentimes in his epistles, but people don't pick that up and they don't go back and look at what he's quoting to see what he's saying. But anyway, let's look at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to start at verse 1, and let's say we'll go down to verse 12. And you, talking about the Ephesian Gentiles who are converts, we talk about converts to what in a second? And you hath he quickened, who were dead and trespasses in sin, wherein in time past ye walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience, among whom also we all had our conversation in time past in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature children of wrath, even as others. But Yah, who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together in Messiah, by grace ye are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Messiah, Yahweh which says here, Christ Jesus, but his real Hebrew name is Messiah, Yahweh Shah. In the that in the ages to come he might show exceeding the exceeding riches of his grace in his kindness toward us through Messiah Yahweh Shah. For by grace, this is the verse everybody knows, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of Yah, not of works, lest any man should boast. See, this is one of those verses they they being the heathen try to use, say there's no law. That's not correct. See? The power of Yah is revealed to repentant sinners. All have sinned and come short of the glory of Yah. Since we have sinned, there's nothing we can do going forward to take care of our past sin in terms of in our own strength. All the obedience in the world going forward, all the church going, all the whatever, all the, the costume wearing, all the Sabbath keeping, all the vegetarian, there's nothing you can do going forward to take care of your past sin. Only, the only thing that's required is death. Okay? And so, Father sent Messiah to be the mercy seat, the sacrifice for our past sin. That does not mean, and that is grace. We didn't deserve to be rescued by Messiah. Yet, Father sent him. That's what the scripture is saying. It is not saying that once you are forgiven of your past sins, you go forward in sin. 
See, that's where the Christians get it wrong. And talking about doing away with Yah's law, which is blasphemy. But instead, what happens is Messiah gives you what? Power. Power in his father's righteousness to be obedient. That's what he does. See? And now you can go forward in the father's spirit, overcoming sin because of what happened, what Messiah did for us. It does not mean we continue in sin, we continue breaking his law, we continue, or we even start making claims that his law is done away with. That's a Christian thing. That's, that's not even good. But let's continue on. Not a works lest any man should boast. Wow, watch now. This is the important part. For we are his workmanship created in Messiah, Yahweh, unto good works, which Yah hath before ordained that we should walk in them. Wherefore, remember, watch this. Remember that ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh. These are people that are what we would say today, Europeans, right? Because Paul, the apostle Paul was in an area which is now Turkey, which is European. That's European right now, right? So he said, ye being in time past, Gentiles in the flesh who are called uncircumcision. See, again, I want to stress that in, in the New Testament, when they use the word circumcision, they're talking about the Israelites, the Hebrews. When they use the word uncircumcision, they're talking about Gentiles, which we call Europeans most what they're talking about. So here, talking to Ephesians, he's saying to the church at Ephesus, the people there, ye being in time past, past Gentiles who were called uncircumcision. That's who they were. By that which is called circumcision in the flesh made by hands. They were called uncircumcision by Israelites, by Hebrews. They were called Gentiles or uncircumcised by Israelites. Okay? And that's common throughout the Bible. You know, many times they would call, in fact, David, before he slew Goliath, he called him an uncircumcised. He said, you can kill this uncircumcised even. That's what he said. So that's not unusual. But look, verse 12, along with that, Along with that, that at that time, and I might be missing some of the video here because my video is starting to act up. No surprise there. Heavenly Father, please guide us and direct us in your spirit and in your truth that your name will be uplifted, honored, and glorified. And Messiah, how shall we pray? Amen. That at that time, you were without Messiah. Watch this now. This is the important part. Being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. This is what they were. Before they received Messiah. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. And strangers from the covenants of promise. Having no hope and without Yah in the world. Do you see that? There's a lot of implications here. So before they received the grace that came through the Hebrew Messiah. They were outside the commonwealth of Israel. They were strangers from the covenants of promise, and they had no God. No matter what they were worshiping. He said they were without God, without Yah in the world. But since, that implies, since they've received the Hebrew Messiah, they are now part of the commonwealth of Israel, and they do have a God. His name is Yah. Okay? So there is an Israel... There is a nation that the Gentiles become part of. This is, this is what the church really is. It's not a building or a 501c3 corporation. It's a nation of people that are the bloodline of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those people that join them in, in, that, in that nation through repentance in the, in, in the Hebrew Messiah. Okay? So that's... Okay, so now that's the first angel's message. So now you see, go back to Revelation 14. That's the first angel's message. Revelation chapter 14, verse 7. We read this before. Saying with a loud voice, Fear Yah and give glory to him for the hour of his judgment is come and worship him that made heaven and earth the sea in the fountains of water. So now we're, they're, they're seeking to worship. They're, they're asking people to worship the Hebrew Messiah. Okay, they ask people to worship him because work and worship not just the Hebrew Messiah, but the Father, his father. Because he said, 
him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. And that comes directly from the Sabbath commandment of the covenant, which is given directly to the Israelite people. Okay? Okay, again, let's, let's notice it says here, worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. What indicates that he's the creator in the covenant? It's the fourth commandment. Let's take a look at this. Exodus chapter 20. Exodus chapter 20. And I apologize for those in YouTube um, that are that are having connection problems. It's not your computer. It's mine. It, it's And those of you in Periscope are probably able to hear it, hopefully hear with no problem. But um, in YouTube, it's, it's giving us all kinds of issues. But in Exodus chapter 20, we're going to begin at verse 1. Look at it, verse 1 and 2, just to start us off. Verse 1 and 2. Actually, yeah, 1 and 2. And Yah spake all these words, saying, I am Yahweh thy most high, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. This is the audience that he's speaking to. He spake all these words saying that he is the one that brought a certain people out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage or slavery. He brought you out of slavery. He delivered you. Okay? Out of slavery. Then he starts and he starts telling them, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Okay, thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above, or is that earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, Yah, am a jealous Most High, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Okay, then this, then there's the third one. Thou shalt not make take the name of Yahweh thy most high in vain, for Yahweh will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. And then there's the fourth one. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work. But the seventh day is the Sabbath of Yahweh thy most high. In it thou shalt not do any work. Thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor the strangers that are in thy gates. And watch verse 11. For in six days Yahweh made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore Yahweh blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Notice it said, he made heaven and earth. And then in, in Revelation 14, 7, it says, and worship him that made heaven and earth, the sea and the fountains of water. So your call is to the covenant of Yah. The covenant of Yah was given to one nation, the Israelite people. Therefore, you're going to be joined with the Israelite people if you're going to keep this covenant. Okay? You're going to be joined with them if you're going to keep this covenant. You're going to be part of a nation of people that are Israelite people. True Israelite people. This is uh, uh, most commonly referred to as the descendants of slaves today. Just like they were then. Remember he said, I brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. He delivered them from slavery. So that former slaves were the chosen people. Take note, please. It says it right there. Former slaves were the chosen people. Okay? It's the same at the end. As it was in the beginning, so shall it be at the end. Today, the chosen people are the former slaves. Same thing. Okay? And as the Egyptian leaders would not listen to Moses when he asked to let the people go, so today the powers that be are not listening or not heeding or don't care about our demands for justice, our demands for equality. They don't care about them. Okay? And as it ended for Pharaoh with the destruction of his nation, so it will end for the Gentiles today with the destruction of this entire system. That's what's coming. Okay? Now, in order for this to be accomplished, we talked about beginning the whole man. Fear Yah and keep his commandment. For this is the whole man. And we talked about the 144,000. So now let's go to Revelation again. Revelation chapter 7. Well, let's go back to 14 for a second. Revelation 14. A couple of things about the character traits of the 144,000 that are extremely important for us to take note of as we're living in the time of the 144,000. If the first angel's message has begun, which means the everlasting gospel, the true gospel, 
is being preached now from the Israelites, okay, about the true Hebrew Messiah, about the Father's righteousness that's being preached now, not just for myself, but others. The message is going out. Therefore, the 144,000 are on the scene. They're now being prepared. Okay, they're here. Okay, again, let's take a look about the 144,000. Okay, Revelation chapter 14, verse 1. And I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 5, because this describes the character and origin of the 144,000. Let's take a look. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their forehead. And I heard a voice from heaven, as the voice of many waters, and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harp. And they sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song, but the hundred and forty and four thousand which were redeemed from the earth. These are they which are not defiled with women, for they are virgin. These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the firstfruits unto Yah and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no God, for they are without fault before the throne of God. Unfortunately, there are many people, many, many, many people that read this and make conclusions just based on this these six verses or five verses that they read about the 144,000 without understanding the rest of what the prophets say, the rest of the Bible or anything else. Just, you know, like, for example, many people argue they're going to be virgins. They're never going to have had sex. I know it's silly, but that's what it's saying. That's what they say. The word virgin here is not the woman that they're talking about. You have to understand even the rest of the book of Revelation. There are two women in the book of Revelation that are chapter 12 and there verse 1 and there appeared a great wonder in heaven a woman clothed with the sun and moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars it's not a literal woman this is representing the nation of israel i have likened the nation of israel to a comely and delicate woman jeremiah said so that's that it's not a literal woman and it's not here in 14 and then there's another woman uh revelation chapter 17 revelation chapter 17 Verse 3, so he carried me away in the spirit into the wilderness, and I saw a woman sit upon a scarlet colored beast full of names of blasphemy, having seven heads and ten horns. There are two women in the, in the book of Revelation. One is representing the nation of Israel, the chosen people, the 12, 12 the crown of 12 stars on their head. That's the, the, the notion, uh, excuse me, the nation of Israel with the 12 tribes. I'm bumbling, sorry. The other woman is a whore. That's representing the beast. That's representing the Roman Catholic Church and all of its Christian offshoots. That's that whore. So when it says this one is not defiled with women, they're not defiled, they're not made unclean by joining forces with the whore. They've separated from it. Which is also, of course, the call of Revelation 18. Also, of course, Jeremiah chapter 15, 51. Also, Isaiah chapter 47, I believe, 47, 48. The same call. Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers with her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues. So, in other words, the call is to come away from this woman so that they're not defiled with woman. It doesn't mean they never were with her. Notice what it says. It says, these are they fought, these were redeemed from among men. Redeemed means they were once in sin and been cleansed from sin. Redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto Yah and to the Lamb. Okay? So they were once dirty and through the Father's righteousness and Messiah's sacrifice. And repentance, they became clean. They began to reveal Father's righteousness and be obedient to his law. And, and I want you to notice the chapter started out with them standing on Mount Zion. And I often like to point out, it shows you the end result in the beginning of the chapter. And the rest of the chapter shows you how they got there. The events that took place. Same with chapter 13. It shows the end result 
of the beast power Babylonian system in verses one and two. But then the rest of the chapter shows you the path that caused them to get there. Okay. So that you're going to have two entities. You're going to have the 144,000 representing the father and, and being led by the Messiah. And then you on one side, and then you're going to have the world, the world represented by the, the, the false religions of the Christian church and other false religions based out of the Roman Catholic church. There you go. That's what you're going to have. Okay. And that's what's forming. That's what's already being formed right now. There's a movement, even now, that I'm sure many of you have come across. It doesn't have a name. Yes, no, it doesn't have a name, but I'm sure many of you have heard of it. There's a movement of people. Listen to me now. There's a movement of people that are dissatisfied with organized religion. Have you ever heard that? There's a movement of people that's been going on for like this whole generation Z, millennial generation. Because these, these younger people aren't buying by the, for the most part. So there's a generation of people that are not interested in organized religion. For various reasons. Obviously, if it was satisfying their soul, they would be satisfied. They'd be there. But it's not. The hypocrisy and the, and the, and the emptiness of, of lack of changing power is, is driving them away. Okay. And so you're seeing people move away from these organized churches. Now, there are, of course, millions that still go to the organized churches, but I want you to remember the Most High is not calling everybody. He's receiving a remnant. Noah, when I say he's not calling everybody, I mean the message goes to everybody. But now everybody's going to receive it. Noah preached for 120 years. And including himself, it was him and seven other people that were on that ark. When volcanic waters exploded all over the earth and destroyed it and everything upon it except those that were in that ark. It's never a majority. But I'm telling you that when you see a movement of people that are saying, ah, I'm not buying this organized religion thing. They're seeking something more. Right now, some seeking it in veganism and, and um, trying to protect animals or uh, uh, human rights. And they're seeking it in all kinds of things. They're not finding it in any of those things, but they're going to find it in the Father, Spirit of Truth. Because that's where it is. The answer's in the Creator. Okay? Now, 144,000 are shown on Mount Zion with the Lamb. That's how they, that's the end result. That's where they end up. In this God, and I just want to be clear, it's not just them. There's going to, the Bible talks about a numberless multitude of people that could not be numbered that are also saved. We're going to go there in a second of Revelation chapter 7. But what I wanted to point out about this 144,000 is verse 4 and 5. Okay? These are they which were not defiled with women. For they are virgins. Again, that's a pure truth. That's pure, unadulterated righteousness. That's the woman of Revelation 12. Okay, that's not with the woman of Revelation 17. See, they're separated from her. Right? These are they which follow the Lamb whithersoever he goeth. They follow the Lamb wherever he goes. Well, where is the Lamb right now? Right now, as we make alluded to earlier, the Lamb is our High Priest. He's in the heavenly sanctuary. Again, let me give you some scripture for that. Hebrews chapter nine. Hebrews chapter nine. Uh, let's see. Okay, Hebrews chapter nine. I'm going to read Hebrews nine. I'm going to read from verse uh, twenty-four down to verse 28. Now, there's a lot more in Hebrews regarding this, but just for the sake of time, I'm going to share this one, okay? Hebrews chapter 9 from verse 24 to verse 28. For Messiah is not entered into holy places made with hands, which are figures of the truth, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of Yah for us. Remember, he's speaking to Hebrews. That's what this book is 
to be nor yet that he should offer himself often as the high priest entered into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment, so Messiah was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So he's now our high priest. He's entered into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. And so the 144,000 follow him there. What is he doing? He's interceding on behalf of his chosen people, like the high priest Aaron did in Leviticus 16, to remove sin forever from his people. So as he's there on in the heavenly uh, third heaven, in the most holy place, interceding to the Father on our behalf. What is he doing? He's representing his blood, his atoning blood, and his perfect righteousness for us. He became sin for us, who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of the Father in him. So now, He's interceding for us as we are praying and we are in a repentant state, confessing that we are sinners in need of his perfect righteousness. He is now answering us and day by day, hour by hour, week by week, month by month, year by year. He is bringing us through many trials, tribulations, and tests to perfect us, to cause us to continue to give to him all the things that are discovered within us that are unlike him and receiving from him perfection of righteousness and character. Okay? And that's why they're following the Lamb because that's where he is and that's what he's doing. Understanding that, which I'm sharing with you right now for you to do that, follow the Lamb wherever he goes because right now he's atoning for his chosen people's sin and he's seeking he is seeking to cause you to overcome all your sin from that position by the power of Father Spirit. Okay? That's part one. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto Yah and to the land. Why are they called the first fruits? There's an interesting thing and a phenomenon that's going to take place. This is it. Let's think about this. Messiah said, when he was on the earth, no man knows the day and the hour of his return. That's what he said. No man knows the day and the hour but his father only. That's what he said. Okay? Think about this. At some point, Messiah is going to return. Hmm? I mean, he said he would. Okay. When he's returning, Father is going to be the one to say, son, it's time to go. Go get my people. At that time, obviously, Messiah is going to know the day and hour of his coming. So there's going to come a point where Messiah does know. Okay? When Messiah returns to the earth at that time, there are going to be people alive on the earth when he returns. Now, those people that are alive, that are unrepentant sinners, they're going to have a problem that day. But those people that are sealed in the Father's righteousness, this is what's going to be special about them. They're going to see the Messiah return. They're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye. They're going to be raised up into the air with the dead that died in Messiah to meet Messiah in the air, as the scriptures say. And they will have never tasted of death. They will be perfected in Father's righteousness. They will be translated. Now, the Bible only records two men that were translated. Enoch was one. Elijah was the other. Enoch and, and Elijah were the only two. Enoch walked with Yah. Elijah obviously walked with him and he was translated. Now, uh, the last day prophecies of Malachi show us that a form of Elijah is going to come 
and preach a message of returning to the Father's obedience, command, uh, commandments and obedience. That's Malachi chapter, chapter, the last chapter, chapter four. Malachi chapter four. Verse five and six, actually four, five and six. Remember ye the law of Moses, my servant, which I commanded unto him in order for all Israel, again, it's stressing, this is for Israel, with the statutes and judgment. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and coming, uh, excuse me, great and dreadful day of your of, of your hour. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to the fathers I come and smite the earth with a curse. So he says, Elijah going to come. That's the 144,000. Because like Elijah, they're going to be translated. And there are others with them. So the people that are belong to the Most High when Messiah returns, along with those that are in the first resurrection, they're people that are going to have never tasted death. That makes them the first fruit. Makes them the first fruit. Unto God. Okay. Continue. Revelation chapter 14. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven. Excuse me. Excuse me. Sorry. Verse 5. And in their mouth was found no guile. Guile. Mm, guile. Guile is deception. It's deception. Okay? It's deceit. It's lies. In their mouth was found no lies. Now, brothers and sisters, if we're going to be honest with each other and with ourselves, we're going to have to admit all of us have lied. <laughs> Not just have we sinned, which lying is a sin, but aside from other sins we you all committed, all of us have lied. So what does this mean? Does it mean 144,000 have never lied? No, they're not. No. Remember, they're redeemed. What does it mean then? It means they have sought Messiah as the high priest, gotten to the Father through him, received that righteousness in such a way that they get to the point where they're not lying anymore. That is all about truth. That is all about righteousness, which means ultimately is all about glory to the Father. See, obedience to the covenant is ultimate glory to the Father. Fear Yah and keep his commandments, for this is the whole of man. They become this. They become whole. They become sealed, which brings us to Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7. Okay, Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. Revelation chapter 7, beginning at verse 1. I'm going to read from verse 1 down to verse 4. And then I want to skip down for a minute, but from 1 to 4. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the tree, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed and hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribe of the children of Israel. Now, after this, from verses five down to verse eight, it goes into the exactly twelve tribes. It, it names twelve tribes and tells you twelve thousand from each tribe. So we don't need to read all of that. But let's skip down to verse nine. Revelation chapter seven, verse nine. After this, like after the hundred and forty four thousand were sealed. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and peoples and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and palms in their hands. So, so, so again, so I say, there's more than obviously 144,000 is going to be saved. 144,000 are a special group of people that are alive at the time, that give a special message, that are actually representing Elijah and actually John the Baptist, which are actually the the, uh, the the best man, as it were, as John Baptist said, introducing the groom. Okay? Giving the message of the return of the groom. The midnight call. You know, behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. That's the 144,000 
given that message in that parable. Okay, and so there's but there's numberless multitude, and there's numberless for a couple of reasons. Number one, obviously, he he says to represent a lot of people. Obviously, it's a lot of people. That's why he says a numberless multitude. But also, also, if you remember, David was warned to not number 